Well, Greg introduced me to monetary reform, so I'm deeply grateful to Greg for his uh, his uh, his education of me uh, early on. Uh, Greg at that time was with the American Friends Service Committee up in uh, uh, the Cleveland area, and uh, that's where he still lives. Uh, and uh, he was with the AFSC for quite a number of years uh, and provided just dynamic leadership that uh, um, th then when uh, after 2008 and, and finances uh, got hard for lots of uh, uh, nonprofits, uh, I think they, uh, the Cleveland office was closed. And a move to amend was very lucky to get Greg to join that organization as a, as a staff member. So he has been active with move to amend uh, uh, since that time and has provided uh, wonderful uh, leadership there. So uh, uh, with that, let me turn it over to Greg. Thank you, John. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, very good to be with you. Very good to be with all of you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Great, there we go. All right, well, it's good to be with all of you. Sorry, we cannot be physically in person, but that's the way it goes. Sometimes high tech has to take the place of high touch. And so this is one of those examples. Um, so my presentation this uh, afternoon, evening, whatever time frame it may be, depending on what part of the world you're in, um, is on banking on a democracy movement for system change. I'm going to be talking about the need to build a movement to move um, not only monetary reform, but basically every reform out there that's essential. I think it is important that we think sort of from a macro uh, perspective on all of this. So let me begin by talking about Move to Men, which is an organization that's been around now almost for 11 years. It's focusing on fundamental constitutional renewal via what we're trying to do is pass this uh, amendment to the Constitution called We the People Amendment, uh, House J uh, Joint Resolution 48, which currently has 75 House co-sponsors. Its principles, which are listed there uh, from day one, is we are an anti-oppression and solidarity-based uh, group that is focusing on organizing in that vein. We seek to build a coalition uh, that is dedicated to building a movement that is diverse, wide and deep, that is grassroots based, that is dedicated to political education, and that is independent, both politically and economically, because right, we know how that goes. If you are uh, connected in some way to companies, to big foundations, to political parties, to corporations, to the government, then you have strings uh, tied to you, if not around your neck. So. Uh, it's very important to be both politically and economically independent. They go hand in hand. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of individuals that are uh, on our mailing list, hundreds of organizations that have endorsed this effort, 678 resolutions, either via city or state uh, resolutions um, or ballot initiatives, that which has been passed by uh, individuals that have organized citizen initiatives and voted on them at the municipal or in some cases at the state level. And we have local affiliates and working groups as well as a couple of state networks. Uh, this We the People Amendment as previously mentioned, HCR 48, basically three sections. One, it is so audacious to believe that only human beings should have an alienable constitutional rights. People are people, artificial. <coughs> were not mentioned in uh, the Constitution. Second, money is not a form of First Amendment protected free speech. Money is property. If uh, money is speech, then those who have the most money have the most speech and not a real good definition of anything approaching real democracy. And third, uh, nothing in this amendment shall be construed to abridge freedom of So if you were at all uh, akin to this, um, feel moved about this, feel free to go to our website, movetoman.org forward slash motion to sign. And if you're part of an organization, feel free to join again the several hundred organizations 
labor, citizen uh, action, uh, religious, ethical, uh, you name it. Uh, go to moveToMan.org forward slash organization and add your organization to the list. All right. So what are the opportunities for fundamental monetary reform or transform, transformation? There are many. The pandemic that we're living through still has exposed the underlying, many underlying uh, economic cr uh, crises from the debt to jobs, to uh, lack of income, to uh, wealth, to the incredible growing, uh, expanding, deepening uh, economic inequality. Uh, and so that makes democratizing money creation all the more relevant for meeting basic needs, be they physical or human. The pandemic has also awakened the public to the, hi to the hijacked government. Uh, that is, let's be real, the CARES Act and other um, uh, support that has been passed by Congress has disproportionately supported big companies more than small uh, banks. The Fed has helped the well-to-do through the creation of these uh, facility, special facility programs. Uh, we've also seen as a result of the pandemic and what's gone on over the last seven or eight months or more, an increased public awareness, if not fundamental questioning of some basic economic notions, that of perpetual growth on a finite planet. Sorry, that doesn't cut it. Globalization, well, that's not uh, all that keen these days. Even capitalism itself is coming under greater scrutiny. So these are opportunities that the current reality, the current moment is giving us. The threats of uh, the fundamental uh, monetary reform and trans or transformation of the current moment is in some cases the same, the economic crisis. People are so focused on making do, on trying to survive that they don't necessarily have time uh, they certainly have interest, but they don't have time. They don't have the capacity right now to focus on anything other than self-survival. The power of the uh, financial and banking corporations has been replete and is growing by the day. And as previously mentioned, the pandemic has, has expanded, widened, and deepened that. So, But some of these things are ongoing, are they not? The, the ability to create money out of thin air is debt. The distortion of the issue. Uh, by you know, economists and others. The corporate media, of course, has done their bit to try to confuse things and say that we're the experts, leave it to us to figure out what's needed, and you just kind of sit back and cheer or boo. The fire industry, finance, insurance, real estate, far and away, number one in terms of industries that give campaign contributions slash donations slash, slash you know, figure it out, you figure it out. Uh, whether they lease, rent, buy, or retain public officials. And of course, they're political defenders, those who we elect, who are supposed to represent us, but because of the fire industry campaign contributions or donations or investments, uh, feel more beholden to but After all, some of them, even when they're not beholden, just simply don't know this issue, and they don't want to admit they don't know this issue, so they play dumb and, and nod their heads when Jerome Powell and other federal officials come up and testify every six months on Capitol Hill. Another threat is the Fed itself. Assessing big Greg, Greg, I'm going to interrupt here. Just a little point of order. I um, Could you enlarge your screen, put your screen on full? Uh, uh, a slideshow. Yeah. Some well, for some reason, it doesn't work too well. So no. everybody, you can just use the view options, all the participants, and scroll in to 150, and then you can move it to the center. So people can do that on their own at the top of your screen. Yeah, right, 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 right. Let me hear. Uh, viewers, we can do it. I wasn't talking to you, Greg. We oh, can okay. do that on our own. I don't know. OK, I will try to continue here. Uh, all right. So again, federal, uh, the Fed has assisted big companies and of course the creation of these special uh, facilities and as a result of the CARES Act, you may or may not know, uh, the Fed's doings has become a uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. It's become awfully hard to keep track of what the hell they're up to. And again, the lack of widespread uh, public understanding has made it very difficult to help people discern what is true and what is fiction. And of course the threat ongoing of the MMT that is, uh, with all due respect, just simply not going far enough in what is required to bring about fundamental monetary reform or transformation. As Senator Dick Durbin from Illinois, where this event, did, as many uh, years in the past has taken place, said it, 
way back when during the um, economic implosion of 2007 through nine. And the bank's hard to believe in a time when we're facing a banking crisis that many on the banks created um, are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol, Capitol Hill and they frankly own the place. I would argue and assert it's probably just as cogent of a remark today, if not more so. So what we have is basically a political system in which there is this massive disconnect between what the public wants on issue after issue versus the kind of policies we have or don't have. They simply don't represent us. And that is understood increasingly by people across the political spectrum from and everyone in between. Why is this political disconnect uh, present? Well, basically it's a lack of people power. We haven't forced public officials to significantly listen to us, but instead they listen to funders, not to voters, to those who um, uh, have greater influence over them uh, in the power elite. We have to understand, as uh, Mylin Kundera has said, the struggle of man and presumably woman against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. We have a long history in this country of social movements that have uh, caused cases, some reform, in some cases, revolution, significant reform from the revolution itself to anti-slavery, to the post-Civil War, through the creation of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the populist movement of the 1870s through 90s that created many reforms and, and created and caused this um, uh, effort uh, of trying to deal with money creation and democratization of money, labor rights, of course, the creation of labor unions, women's rights and the women's movement resulting in the 19th Amendment, the civil rights uh, movement in the 40s and 50s that resulted in the voting rights and civil rights acts, anti-war Vietnam and Iraq, uh, gay rights uh, beginning in Stonewall, environmental protection that goes all the way to the 70s. And currently in uh, 2020, we have seen uh, uprisings maybe unlike uh, any over the last uh, generation. The uh, Black Lives Movement uprising itself arguably has involved more people than any other single a gathering of people for a single cause in the history of this country. Add to it the Me Too movement, March for Our Lives, immigration, and many others, and people are in motion. People are demanding from the bottom up social change. So the strategy that oftentimes we who are involved, people of conscience, in bringing about change is sort of following kind of a regular sort of prescription. Um, to create, oftentimes we do, a single issue movement. So I am here respectfully saying that our purpose should be not to create a singular monetary reform or transformation social movement, but rather to help make a monetary reform or transformation one piece of a larger democracy movement. The goal is to create real democracy, whatever you wanna call it, real democracy, self-determination, sovereignty, self-governance, democracy, right to decide, whatever it is, but think of it sort of pictorially as trying to enlarge in the big box. We live as citizens and those we elect in a box that is very, you know, in every direction, it's pretty small. And every time the power elite sort of flexes its muscles, they have made that box smaller so that regardless of who it is we elect, regardless of how much energy we put in, through trying to pass laws, regulations, get on the street and protests, we are limited by the dimensions of that democracy, self-governance, sovereignty, whatever you want to call it, box. People, our friends on the right will call it maybe sovereignty, people on the left, democracy, self-government, whatever you call it, basically the right to decide and the ability to self-determine, to decide to have real authentic democracy is getting smaller. And so our goal should be in creating a democracy movement to enlarge in that box. However, current movement building strategies of people of conscience is we work, do we not, on separate issues. It's like we're quarantining ourselves, we're dividing ourselves, we're siloizing ourselves. We work, we work on these issues sort of one at a time. Monday, we may work on you know, healthcare for all, Tuesday on, I don't know, raising the minimum wage. Wednesday, we're trying to stop a toxic dumping, you know, our, 
in our community. Thursday, it's yet something else. Maybe Friday, it's monetary reform. You know, we work vertically, one issue at a time. And it's important that we work on these single issues because that's the only way we get a, a depth of understanding, that we know the history of it, that we know what's gone on in the past, that we know the laws, the regulations, that we know what other people are doing in those other places in our community, in the state, in the country, maybe globally on that single issue. It's very important that we continue and that we do work vertically. However, there is some limitations of that that I'll get to. But right now that seems to be kind of the preponderance of the kind of way we work vertically. We also oftentimes way too much react. We respond, react, resist, oppose. We're constantly forever and ever playing defense. And lastly, we're sort of singling and working on, you know, again, not to say this is unimportant, it is not. It's very important that we focus on changing politicians or keeping those that are, you know, operating and presenting us. That, um, I meant decree and not degree, that we deal with the decrees out there, the executive orders, that we deal with laws and regulations. But, you know, that sort of, all of those together are still kind of surface strategies the reality is the, the strategy of the power elite, they don't work that way. They don't do this. They work together. Yeah, they may oppose these single issues, but they are trying to change the ground rules. They don't, de they don't you know, defend, you know, they'll try to stop something that we're trying to create, but oftentimes they are proactive. They are proposing, they are playing offense and constantly therefore forcing us to play defense. And they don't address surface issues as much. They go for, the root causes, in, if you will, the radical issues, radical, of course, being at root, they go after the systemic issues. Sometimes it's through legislation, through statutes. Other times it's in courts, through constitutions, trying to change the fundamental defining rules. And the goal from their standpoint is to shrink that democracy box, to make it to where almost regardless of who we elect, despite how many people we may get on the street, how loud protests we are, how many petitions we submit, too, that the ability to change is going to be constricted because they are doing the defining. They are making sure that the ability we have, the democratic tools we have are narrower, are smaller, and are weaker. And there's just a boatload of examples currently and throughout history of basically what it is they do. You know, whenever we try to pass, say, local laws around the minimum wage or plastic bags, you know, preventing or campaign finance reform or raising the minimum wage, as Seattle did, you know, tried to do in, in one city or banning fracking or stuff like that. Yeah, the powers to be will, to a certain extent, oppose us in the community. But for the most part, they don't monkey around. They'll go to the state level, if it's a local level, and preempt the damn thing and just say, get the, their friends at the state level to just say, sorry, you at the local level are not allowed to do that. We have preempted you. If we try to do something at the state level, they'll preempt it by kicking it upstairs or downstairs, depending on how you want to look at it, to the federal level. And monopolies is a good example. Going back, you know, a century ago, we think the laws on the book at the federal level dealing with uh, antitrust and monopolies are all that great, though don't look now. They haven't really stopped much of anything, have they? But the Sherman Antitrust Act that goes back to 1890 was a watered down version laws that were much tougher, including in Ohio, John Sherman from Sherman Antitrust fame was a senator from Ohio, didn't like because he was a tool of the police. So he kicked it upstairs to the federal level and said, let's pass something that preempts the state uh, laws that are going on with people flexing their democratic muscles. We can't have that because that's a threat to the powers to be. So let's preempt that by passing a watered down version, but claim that it's great, it's grand, it's really gonna change things. And of course, if you try to pass something that's substantive, which is pretty darn tough these days, at the federal level, then the powers to be are increasingly going to the international level. What do you think these trade deals are about, be it NAFTA or WTO or anything else? They're not really about trade, be it free or fair. It's about who governs, who rules, who decides. And 99% of the time, it's corporate entities that will trump, you know, um, uh, or usurp or trump, um, the laws at the nation state level. If it's trying to, you know, at whatever degree it may be, trying to limit money in elections, what company or what 
have done or individuals have done is they've gone to the court and said, nope, that's a violation of First Amendment, political free speech rights. If communities are trying to demand food labeling or warning you know, potential cancer causing uh, products like what's gone on with uh, Monsanto or now Bayer around the ingredient in um, uh, Ready Roundup, glyphosate. Well, they now claim that it's a violation of uh, my corporation's uh, right not to speak if uh, there's an effort at trying to inspect corporate property to ensure compliance with health, safety, and welfare. Nope, they'll go to court and again, Trump or usurp and say that's a violation of my corporate Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights. If you're trying to uh, uh, promote local family farming over corporate farming, that's a violation. They'll go to court and Trump that law or Trump that uh, a citizen initiative at the state level and say that's a violation of the 14th Amendment, equal protection rights. Then there's efforts, you know, to try to deal with uh, expanding the right to vote. And so what did the powers of be do? They'll gerrymander, they'll increase voting restrictions, they'll purge voters who missed two elections or so. That's what's happened in Ohio. All of that has happened through statutes or they'll go to court. The Shelby County versus Holder Supreme Court decision back in 2013 basically gutted uh, much of the tough efforts at trying to keep some of these states in the South from purging voters and all the like. And if you try to call for public ownership of basic functions, as people did more than a century ago around railroads or around uh, anything else since, they'll try to shift decision-making, the powers to be from the legislative arena to the regulatory arena, where they can control regulators. And even if the regulatory agencies end up making a decision, vision uh, would be for the public, they can always go to court. So the point being, these are rule changes that even though the going to court and saying this is a violation of um, my corporate right not to speak, not only if they win applies to them in that individual circumstance, but it applies then across the board to any other and all other efforts of trying to food label or provide force warnings of elements cancer causing elements. So again, they don't monkey around with a single issue, vertical, they go horizontal. So building a horizontal, and that's what we have to do, is building a horizontal democracy movement, not to give up focusing on single issue movements, but to at least, I would respectfully assert, devote some of our time to building a horizontal democracy movement is, I get it, I understand, I'm trying to be very sensitive to the fact that this is hard to kind of mentally grasp. At least it is and still remains for me because we are, as Sally Campton says, it's hard to fight an enemy who has outposts in your head. We have been conditioned to believe the way, well, we've been conditioned to believe, first of all, that the only form of democracy is voting. And after that, we just sit on our hands and maybe cheer or boo and that's it. But if we do engage in activity, you know, we go out in the street and protest or, you know, we'll focus on one issue at a time, do all that uh, vertical stuff, which again, I'm not trying to say that's completely unimportant. It is, but we don't maximize. We don't sort of synergistically maximize our power by coming together, focusing horizontally. And so, and that's because culturally we have been conditioned to think you're too stupid. You don't know how to organize. You don't know enough. You don't, you know, you got to be John Wayne or Jane Wayne to be the leader, to lead, to do anything, to be effective. You know, all that, you know, pardon my French, is bullshit. Of course, we know better. Uh, people who've come before us whose shoulders we're standing on have risked much more than we are doing today to bring about fundamental change. We can do it, but we just got to break out and dispense with these outposts to say, wait a second, we have to start becoming comfortable at being uncomfortable, at taking some risks and realize we don't know exactly how we're gonna do this because we've never built the kind of movement, this horizontal democracy movement that is required. What is being called for, I assert, is something never been created that has gotta be as wide and as deep to address the fundamental issues that are fundamentally, fundamentally uh, urgent and reflect a crisis of our very existence. All right, to, to do this and to operate in this way, I assert will make it easier to achieve all the issues we care about. If everybody spends at least some time trying to change the ground rules, then guess what? All of us are going to get past first base in trying to get significant healthcare reform, 
education reform, you know, uh, a livable wage, uh, universal basic, in, uh, you know, income, a monetary reform, all of these things, I think, will become easier. And of course, this becomes, if we're working together, it's a defense against the perpetual, you know, a couple of the efforts that the powers to be have used from time immemorial, have they not, is divide and conquer, co-optation. They'll still try to do it. They'll still, to a certain extent, be effective, but it'll be less effective. And of course, this is an accurate reflection of the greater integration of problems and the crises. It's kind of like pickup sticks, right? If you just try to deal with one, people remember pickup sticks? Was that a game that's long ago forgotten? You remember that game where you just try to pull out the one stick? Yes, we do. And you try not to move all the others? I, I think, you know, that's oftentimes what we're trying to do. We spent so much time trying to deal with these, you know, one issues that we don't, you know, realize that the whole thing is going to fall apart or the house of cards. It's all connected. And it also reflects what many believe increasingly that we, we may not have powers to be, given that they become more wider and deeper, that truth be told, I hope it's not true, but I've come to believe that it probably is. That quite honestly, quite frankly, we may not win on anything unless we win everything. And the other point is that the scale, I believe, the scale is told me, the scale of the strategy must nail the scale of the problems that we're up against. For example, if we're dealing with a boat becoming <laughs> submerged, right? We have water in our boat, or if we happen to be on a cruise and it's not going very well, what do we do? We don't solve it by using these tools, right? We don't use a sponge. We don't use a teaspoon. We don't use a cup. Rather, sometimes we need these tools. We need a bucket. We need a large bucket. We need a lot of people with buckets. But rather, sometimes if the problem is massive, then we need a massive, massive water pump. And that's basically what it is, I believe, we're facing, that we have to deal with the appropriate scale of the solution that matches the degree of the problem. Minor problems, fine. Minor solutions. Problems within the existing system, okay, we can get away with reform. But if the problems that we're dealing with are of the system, sorry, friends, then all we can do and must do is focus at the systemic level the transformational level, the institution. Uh, and that's where I think we are at. So what do we do? How does this work in building a horizontal democracy movement? Well, again, what we're trying to do is, is sort of get out of this, you know, the, the things in our head, the outposts and say, you know, we've got we've to give up and trying to plead, hope, ask kindly uh, the powers to be to do nice things for us. We have to demand, we have to force them and the only way to do that is you have to build power. And the only way to do that is you've got to form a powerful movement, the right to decide. That's the goal, people power, uh, to create radical democracy, uh, statutory change sometimes, but at a more fundamental level, I would assert constitutional change. Because if you just focus on statutory change, even if it's fundamental statutory change, we know how statutes work. They can be passed today, but the next time the Congress, the state legislature, the city council changes, guess what? It can be undone. If you pass something at the constitutional level, that's much more difficult to undo. So how do we do it? Well, we have to work at both levels. We have to work both, I would assert, vertically and horizontally. So continue taking the vertical approach and doing what we're doing on fundamental, whatever the issue is. And in, and in the case of the circle of friends here, it's monetary change but we also have to think about going horizontal to authentically connect and build relationships with other organizations that make sense, that somehow we think are working to change. We've got two minutes, two minutes. I, I need you to wrap up, I'm so sorry. Okay. But thank on you other for all this. I, I appreciate your enthusiasm and passion right now. All right. Cool. And then we, help, we have to create a diverse, independent, grassroots, authentic democracy movement that is all of those things. And actually, I am almost done. So how does this fundamentally reply to monetary, these fundamental things apply to monetary change? Well, you know, to a certain extent, as we know, fundamental monetary change programmatically doesn't require constitutional change only to implement Article One, Section 8, right? But you will need a constitutional change if you want to concretize 
uh, the creation of a monetary authority that I know is being and will be discussed later on. And you're going to need a constitutional change uh, if you want to create the power to force Congress to create money as credit a la the Need Act. So increasing the movement for fundamental system change requires widening and deepening and heightening our actions. Uh, there's all of those instances where we've seen in the past, people are thinking big, people are thinking systemically. We at Move to Amend have done the same. Uh, we've recently had this People's Movement Assembly and there's internationally, I don't know if you followed what, what's going on in places like Chile, in Bolivia, in El Salvador and other places where people are not just talking about kicking the bums out, but they're talking about changing fundamentals, changing the constitution, making fundamental changes. I will add this, that right now, there's a heck of a lot of uncertainty. Well, let's make that half cup, uh, not just half empty, but half full. When nothing is sure, then everything is possible. So I invite people to check us out and move to amend again. Uh, feel free to sign the motion and move to amend and a little shameless uh, self-promotion. Some of you may know that I issue a monetary history calendar that's trying to help people become literate on these issues because political education on whatever issue we're talking about is so important. That's my very small contribution to the cause. I also issue every week something called a real democracy history calendar, and there's the address for that. So great. Sorry, many, course, many thanks. Know. Many, many thanks. I personally have great appreciation for your monetary history calendar and recommend it to everyone. And i um, grateful that you could participate in this today. Thank you. You're very welcome. Look forward to cussing and discussing about this later on. Okay, very good. If this video is helpful, please hit the like button. Subscribe for new video notifications. Please consider donating at monetary.org forward slash donate. Don't forget to check us out on Twitter at AMI Monetary or on our website.